Okay. We're live. Um, hello, friends. Uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Uh, since 2013, we've been making high quality knowledge accessible, uh, easily accessible, and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. And for us, the qualification to be a leader was. Uh, is taking a step towards finding solutions to and through ways. It doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community and any point in their lives or professions. Uh, but all they need is uh, to be is to be willing to be able to take a step. And uh, so if not for our work, most of this information would have uh, stayed immobilized or landfilled in lengthy PDFs and uh, limited uh, to expensive international conferences. So we are extremely happy about the impact we've been creating. But um, as you know, this is just a drop in the ocean. But then again, an ocean is just a collection of drops. So uh, the, the, the scale of challenges we face are planetary. And uh, we, have our, we have our battles to fight. We'll have many heroes, successes, and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those um, who are not ready yet, um, take your time, and when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you take the next step. And I'll be here to help in any other way possible. And uh, B Waste Wise, in addition to just the global dialogue on waste, we also have other programs. One of them is the Waste uh, Pioneers list. Uh, we publish that list every year. And once we publish the list, we also uh, conduct Q&A sessions with the pioneers and also interview series with the uh, pioneers, so we have them published. Uh, they're already being published on the website, so please check them out. And we're also uh, planning a interview weekly interview series with the individual pioneers. That will also be announced soon, so um, follow us and subscribe to the monthly newsletter so that um, you're aware of, um, you're, you're updated. Uh, we also have ongoing Twitter interviews. Uh, you know, you'll find them if you're on Twitter. It's really easy to follow them. And we have something called the community newsletter. So if you've ever been a, a panelist or a contributor to Be Waste Wise, then you could use this community newsletter to um, tell the rest of our uh, large, really large community that um, uh, about your updates, about, your, um, about any articles that you've written, or about any job um, uh, opportunities that um, you might have. So any updates that you have, you can share them through the community uh, newsletter that we send to um, our, our subscribers. And uh, finally, um, I've been um, actively seeking employment. And uh, this has taught me that um, for uh, the waste management sector or circular economy globally, I mean, there is no single platform uh, to be able to search for good jobs. So um, another drop in the ocean is uh, we will help um, uh, so if you have any job opportunities, let us know, and then we'll put them in the newsletter and then send it to uh, the subscribers again. And we'll also put them on uh, the LinkedIn group so that more people can see it and it'll act as a platform for uh, job seekers. Um, you know, this is all a part of uh, um, getting new talent and young talent and uh, better talent into the sector so that, you know, we could make better impact. And um, finally, uh, if you if you like what you're watching and if you think you're learning, then uh, share it, share it with your networks, and that's a simple first step towards change. And if you have questions or comments, you can use the question and answer box on the screen below, or you can tweet with the hashtag waste dialogue. Um, it's spelled as W A S T E D I A L O G uh, hashtag waste dialogue. And depending upon uh, how many questions we have. We have up to 20 minutes for speakers to respond to them. And um, so, yeah, so welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. And uh, coming to today's session, uh, we already have uh, Robert Crocker with us today here. And um, and in, in today's session, going beyond the circular economy, we wanted to begin this, uh, we wanted to use this um, topic to begin the Global Dialogue on Waste and so that we could contribute uh, to a more robust vision for, for the circular economy. And um, if we believe that if circular economy has to become a new paradigm, new economic paradigm, and remember the if, so if circular economy has to become a new economic paradigm by re replacing our existing models, then um, 
we feel that its uh, current vision is not bold enough uh, because it excludes some of the most important issues of our times like consumption, poverty and inequality and uh, putting a price on uh, pollution. So, um, and, and, but to be fair, those who practice circular economy acknowledge its roots in different schools of thought all of which deal with uh, living within the means of the planet while regenerating polluted places. But none of those um, have achieved nearly as much traction as circular economy in the last few years. So this is an effort to explore the issues that any movement, um, any current or future movements have to include to be able to create a new economic paradigm for our planet. So with that, um, let me introduce uh, Robert to all of you. Robert um, is the author of uh, uh, somebody else's problem, consumerism, sustainability, and design. Um, he was very nice and sent me um, a copy to read, and I'm almost done towards the end and in the last chapter. It's an amazing book, and um, I, I recommend all of you um, read it um, in some format. So, um, Robert, welcome. Um, how are you doing? Good. Thank you. Good. I know it's um, really late uh, in Australia, so uh, and you told me you're an early riser, so I'm um, sorry about No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, one of the issues um, we had with the Global Dialogue on this was we could never have uh, um, the entire planet um, participating in it at once, and um, Australia was always left out. So. Um, this is the first time we have someone from Australia talking on the Global Dialogues on this. So welcome and uh, thanks for representing Australia. Thank you. Thank you. No. So, um, Robert, um, tell me a little bit about yourself, um, you know, about the book, you know, why did you write it and about your work and, you know, so that our listeners get a better idea. Okay. Well, I, um, uh, I'm a historian. Um, I began life as a historian of ideas, actually, of science and ideas. And um, uh, my early book, um, my, my earlier publications, quite a few of them were on ideas about nature in early modern Europe. Um, but about uh, 25 years ago, I became involved through uh, a very serious accident in um, uh, pedestrian advocacy. And um, uh, that has to be the hardest kind of environmental activism I know because pedestrians are not really noticed until they're knocked over or until there's a problem. So trying to persuade people that it's worth creating a city that you can walk around is actually very, very hard. So I spent 10 years struggling um, in that space and um, uh, I can honestly say that at the end I was very pleased because I, those traffic engineers I was tackling with started to sound a bit like me uh, when they were talking about the environment. So they began to understand what I was saying but it, it is very difficult because um, uh, you know what I was really discovering in that in that sort of period of my life, I suppose, was that um, uh, systems like the road system are really blinding. They, they possess us, they lock us in. We become so used to the idea that we have to drive anywhere and everywhere. We usually don't notice the uh, children who can't drive or you know, the elderly people who can't drive and how it um, lowers their quality of life in many cities not to have access to um, those places they really value. And it, it also taught me how um, when a system is so dominant, um, we recognize its values, uh, we recognize its financial worth, its value, but we discount its problems. So we don't really recognize that it has, uh, you know, that it kills. Um, in America, I think the figures are around the same as the number of people killed in the Vietnam War uh, die every year on the roads. Um, in Australia, it's a similar figure. So those sort of figures, nobody jumps up about uh, up and down about them, really. Uh, we, we treat them as the weather. So I guess that experience really got me used to the idea that systems were very, very powerful. And I soon found myself um, uh, involved in other environmental 
issues because of this and and this also led me to question a lot of what i was reading in the history of design and the history of technology because i was teaching those subjects at the time so so that's really the background of the book um although later on uh probably about five years ago i i was teaching um uh, a master's of sustainable design and i was responsible for the um uh, you know, for the theory side, for the history side of the, the course. And um, I felt there was nothing really that I could give my students on consumption that really um, made much sense. So I, that's what really led me to uh, develop this book. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there on consumption, but it, it, it's only in the last few years that it started to, that these uh, sociologists and others have started to talk about the environment. Um, you know, and, and in a way that, that is normal because consumption tends to be separated from the environment. It's not seen as an environmental issue. It's only very recently that people have started talking about the impact of uh, consumption on the environment. So that's really the subject of my book, yeah, and and the problem that it that this involves. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So um, thank you. So um, well, uh, to begin with, since we're talking about um, a vision for circular economy, so can, can you um, talk about um, your vision for um, the future of the planet, and you know what roles do you think um, consumerism and consumption and design play in it. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, I should probably start by saying, I think our present situation is very, very serious. You know, we are in a, a position um, a bit like what my parents' generation went through in 1938. We've been spending, um, since the 1950s really, we've been, um, uh, making more stuff uh, more efficiently, more quickly for more people. And um, the, uh, the kind of, um, if you like, uh, the, the effect of this uh, escalating problem, um, you know, is very much a 1938 moment. What I mean is that in 1938, um, everyone in Europe was hoping that nice Mr. Hitler would um, make a deal and uh, calm down and uh, let everyone live in peace and this is ha this never happened and I think in a way we're in this moment where there are people wanting to escape the problem by saying it's not really happening and by saying how you know good it is because there's been a lot of people who are now uh, no longer in extreme poverty who were in extreme poverty but to me this is really avoiding uh, the issue we have very very dramatic material changes uh, driven by technology and by industrial efficiency producing uh, so much uh, so much material um, we also have uh, scientific changes which are very dramatic and um, we also have uh, an environmental crisis which is becoming more and more um, uh, disturbing you know physically to the planet so Given that background, I feel that uh, I mean, in my my life, my 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 position, I suppose, is that everyone has to do the best they can with what they have, and I'm the sort of person that I enjoy research, I enjoy writing. So, rather than going out there carrying banners and um, trying to get politicians to listen, I'm trying to use my uh, my, my, my skill as a writer to at least make people more aware of this problem. I suppose I, I slightly differ with you, you know, in your opening statement in that I feel that, um, you know, looking for solutions is very, very important. And, you know, I'm surrounded by very clever people who come up with some solutions in certain areas, you know, and they can be very specific scientific ones technological ones, but I'm very concerned that uh, we have to really face this, this, this uh, elephant in the room of consumption. And uh, when we talk about the circular economy, um, 
it's certainly very, very important that uh, Rolls Royce and big companies uh, do things with their their industrial processes to make them more efficient and less wasteful. That's very important. But until we start looking at everyday life and behavior and throwaway things and fast moving things, uh, the systems we live with, like cars, you know, um, transport systems, communication systems, all these are things that we tend to sort of treat as though they're out of bounds because they're making people a lot of money. And um, my view is these things have to change. And there's, there's a very important role for government and for policymakers in this as well. Uh, but until you understand the extent of the system and are really willing to spend a bit of time thinking about it and how it um, has been internalized since the 1950s, um, it, I, I'm, I, what I'm worried about is we'll continue focusing upon glamorous individuals with big ideas who promise to change the world rather than talking to people in, say, Jakarta who, you know, are dealing with waste, you know, like one of my PhD students, um, you know, who are actually seeing, you know, the kind of uh, um, the result of all this consumption and the kind of problems we have. So for me, the circular economy is a good start. That's what I'll say. <laughs> um, so, um, so in terms of... Right. Uh, the, yeah, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, well, I think the circular economy is is, is a, a very important start. And um, but uh, what I would like to do is to remind everyone involved in the circular economy that while you can put little boxes up that say consumption, uh, you know, say production, consumption, and waste, it's very important to put between those boxes uh, the market. What is the market doing with that material? Uh, going from production to consumption. Uh, what, are the, what are changes in prices? Because price comes into this a lot. Uh, one, of the, uh, great, uh, one of the insights of the great uh, economist um, Stanley Jevons in the 19th century was to recognise that when you produce um, uh, more, when, when you make a system more efficient, you tend to lower costs and this will generate more consumption. And, you know, we, we sort of understand this, but what, what happens when everyone is actually trying to help that system produce more stuff for more people? You end up with things like the throwaway coffee cup. What is it, 500 billion perhaps? We don't have accurate figures, but 500 billion a year uh, just for saving a few minutes on your way to work or whatever where it's very easy to bring your own or just to use the ceramic cup and stand at the bar as they do in Italy. So that sort of thing, um, okay, we can, we can recycle it, we can create technologies to uh, separate the plastic from the paper, but um, the, the issue really is, is it worth cutting down all those forests um, and taking all that water to make something um, so wasteful and so uh, irresponsible, really. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my question, I suppose. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, this actually uh, r reminds me of um, a quote uh, that I heard in a TED talk from, I think, Janice Potochnik, um, where he says that, um, and I also found the Nature article he was referring to, which says that um, consumption and uh, consumption per capita consumption rate and um, uh, population growth are the two major drivers which drive all other anthropogenic changes on, on the planet and which is why uh, we believe you know talking about consumption is so important because no one else is doing that um, and um, so so in your book you say that our consumption and our impact on the planet are dictated mostly by systems so this is something which might um, come as a uh, you know shock to many activists who are doing work you know trying to change behaviors and trying to change personal habits so, but in your book you very clearly uh, say that most of our impact are dictated by systems and infrastructure and not by individual behavior um, and you also I, I think I believe you say even if you're the greenest person even if you're a sage um, you would still have a significant impact on the environment because of how your systems and infrastructure are already set up. So in, in such a situation, um, 
what's the role of the individual then? You know, how do they engage with the systems and how, how do they, you know, bring about change? Well, I guess, I guess I should explain that this book in a way was partly written for my students. Um, and they, uh, these are young professional designers, lovely people. They come from all over the world, um, South America, America, Canada, um, you know, and so for the last 10 years I've been teaching these students and one of the things that really struck me when uh, they came to me was they had all uh, sort of swallowed the idea that, um, you know, if they just designed greener stuff, things would change and things would get better and everything would be okay. So, you know, I, I wanted, I was aiming uh, the book to some extent at them, but I'm also very much concerned that Turning um, individuals into heroes, consumption heroes, is a bad idea because what it does is it distracts us from systems. That doesn't mean that the individual is not important. You know, it doesn't mean that we are helpless. You know, um, in fact, I really think that everyone can make a difference uh, because, um, you know, even if you, you know, e even if you don't have um, you know, if you use your skills, if you use what you have, you can make a difference in your life in all kinds of ways. But when it comes to consumption, um, you know, if you look at, say you take the four or five um, kind of areas that people interact with systems in their homes, you know, things like electricity and power and gas, etc. They don't usually determine where these come from. Yeah. Transport. Um, often they're stuck, you know, if they're living in a suburb or, uh, you know, they're often stuck with whatever's available, you know. Um, food, you know, supermarkets. Um, you know, you might be a wealthy person who can make a lot of choices, but most people in the world can't, yeah. And things like shopping and clothing, that again is largely determined by systems, yeah. So those four areas when you look at the individual, the way that, that um, the individual's consumption then adds to other individuals' consumptions within the same kind of uh, context, you know, like say you have 10 houses in a street, um, you might have somebody who really consciously tries to do the right thing, you know, out of those 10 houses um, and might uh, you know, reduce them there, you know, but if they stay on the grid and they behave like normal people, they go to work and they do all the rest of it, probably they'll get to about 20% difference, you know, unless of course you become a monk and you don't interact with anyone and you just withdraw, you know, <laughs> and then to some extent you can, you know, you can probably go much further, but for most of us with children, with, with responsibilities, this is very hard. And I actually question whether your time is, is better spent ringing your MP or your congressman, uh, trying to get engaged with others in changing these systems, in trying to change politically a system that tends to encourage overconsumption and waste. So, you know, that that's really my... Um, I'm also very concerned about um, the messaging that tends to be uh, you know, that was very popular for about 10 years where big companies would say, you know, um, all you need to do is this, uh, you know, and big charities as well. All you need to do is ride a bike and everything will be different. I actually ride a bike, but it hasn't changed the world. You know, <laughs> I really enjoy riding my bike, but it's not it's not going to. It, you know, it gives me health and I enjoy it and I, you know, I, I use it a lot. And Doesn't it my, take time uh, yeah. and a lot of people doing it to, to create change though? I mean. Well, yes, I think, um, I think what happens is that when you get enough people who recognize there's a problem, they start to push, you know, and the push is the really important thing. What, I, what I'm really against, and this is very important for designers to understand, is blaming individuals for not being green enough, yeah? Because what tends to happen is when green becomes very trendy, you imagine you can change the world and uh, 
you don't really recognize that often some of the poorest people are the ones most locked in. You know, they're the ones who are kind of forced to shop in the supermarket. You know, they live miles from anywhere where there's no public transport, so they have to drive the old car, you know, the smoky old car, you know. So it's it's kind of, um, you know, like I, you know, I travel a lot and, you know, you get on a, a rickshaw in, in Delhi, you know, and those guys suffer so much, you know, they have such a hard life. Um, you know, they have to accept what the systems give them. And I think this you'll find this all over the world. That's why I'm very, very wary of blaming individuals and also because I think it tends to divert people from the importance of systems, yeah? So that's really what I'm, I'm trying to get at. And I think for waste managers, it's really obvious because you're, you know, you're, you're looking at this mountain. It's a bit like you're standing in a street and somebody above you, it's a bit like a medieval town, you know, people above you are pouring buckets of slops over you, you know, <laughs> and you're standing there saying, hey, I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to clean it up. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, all right. right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's what I was um, <laughs> Right, no, that, that makes sense. So um, you don't want um, the messaging to get diluted by distractions and, you know, focus on um problems which could create um a greater impact i guess i mean uh, and um and can i can i just finish what i was what i'm really arguing for is that a focus on the individual tends to encourage more consumption uh con green consumerism as well that's another point um because um, really, if you're going to be really serious, you recognize that there's no such thing as a perfectly green object. What we do is with green things, we measure them against benchmarks um, that are greener. You know, so, for example, a green car uh, is no longer a Prius. Ten years ago, a green car was a Prius. Now a green car is a Tesla. You know, um, in 10 years' time, it'll be something else, maybe a hydrogen car, you know. So what I'm saying is that they all have a footprint. They all have uh, environmental costs, you know, resource costs, water costs. Um, so, you know, that what we have to do is stop competing and understand and just try and just calmly look at the problem and the scale of it. And it is massive. It's a planetary scale problem, yeah, as you said. <laughs> Um, thank you. <laughs> so, um, um, well, one one um, clarification. So, Professor Carl Zimring from uh, Pratt Institute says that the greenest car now is the zip car um, because you can share share it. Um, a lot of people can share the same um, infrastructure. Um, but um, what you're talking about also reminded me of uh, another panel that we're going to have um, later in the in this dialogue um, on uh, collective action. And there we have uh, two um, activists, Olivia Lapierre and uh, Chanel Crosby, who will be talking about the lack of representation of um, populations which will be most affected by, you know, uh, these uh, changes that we're, the environmental changes that we're going through, and how it's extremely easy, and how zero waste movements are um, um, mostly represented by people who could make choices like who are wealthy enough, who are privileged enough to be able to make choices and change their lifestyles accordingly. But then they believe that they're not completely represented by people who need to so that they can be more resilient towards change. So uh, that that's that. But um, I want to get to the next question because uh, we only have another uh, 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, time flies by really fast when, you know, you're having the discussion. So in, in, in the book, um, you talk about your dad's lifestyle. Hmm. Your dad yes. would be the age of my grandfather. So I think their age uh, was more circular, you say in the book, or sustainable because uh, products and services were expensive and not affordable to many. Um, so, so considering sustainable development goals, if the, if the prices of materials and services are high, then we'll not be able to address poverty uh, because back then many people were also very poor. Um, so, and, but if the same prices are low, uh, then it increases consumption and therefore our absolute environmental, our total environmental impact. So, um, 
how should we think about this problem? Should we just um, keep the, like, I mean, sh should the prices just be high? Um, and you know, keep all of these people out of the system. Uh, like, how should I, I mean? It's a paradox. I mean, as a you know human being, I cannot think of a place where I would want you know many people to live in poverty just so that um, well, I, I would end there. But how should I think about this? You know, um, you've worked on this for so long. So, can you help me? Um, well, I should just say my father was a pretty extraordinary guy. He died at a hundred, uh, born in 1902, brought up on a a little, well, a farm, quite a, uh, you know, most farms in Australia are large by, you know, European standards. But, you know, he didn't have electricity, uh, you know, everything was horse drawn. So then he moved into the 20th century. And um, by the time he died, there was uh, computers and a lot of things he didn't understand. But um, why I sort of bring him into my book is that I see sustainable consumption as, uh, you know, in, in a way it's an extension of my argument around systems that our behavior is very much conditioned by what we're used to. He grew up uh, and his formative years were during a lot of economic hardship, you know, in the 20s and 30s. So he saw, um, uh, you know, he, I, I call him in the book a um, custodial consumer because uh, you know, he, one of his favorite sayings was caveat emptor, you know, buy, beware. Um, <laughs> so he he didn't see, uh, you know, he saw possessions as uh, things that you had some responsibility for. You know, he would darn his own socks, you know, this sort of thing, which people uh, don't do now, or some people do, but very few. So, you know, he would never throw anything away unless it was really broken. So, you know, to me, it's uh, that kind of consumption in a way, we need a bit more of that, you know, to, um, uh, you know, but what you're saying in a way about um, the sustainable development goals, my concern, uh, probably like uh, those of your, your activist guests later, is that, um, you know, the, what we seem to be doing is we're, we're, we're kind of in a way enriching uh, one part of the world at, at the expense of another in a kind of a, um, uh, you know, the, the, well, well, the issue with sustainable consumption is that if we keep making things faster and faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper, we're not necessarily making the things we really need. Um, we're not necessarily making the things that will last and will be useful to us. So I think there's a, there's a sort of a middle ground between the two extreme sort of scenarios you or arguments in a way that you present, presented in your question. Um, uh, for example, um, if you look at uh, a lot of the everyday things in the supermarket now, a lot of them are very cheap, uh, fast moving products that are deliberately engineered to last for very short periods of time. What they're trying to do is to make sure that you go back many times and you engage in many transactions. You know, like um, I've got a, you know, my dad and people older than me always used to have razors that lasted maybe 10 years or so. They might change the blades every few weeks, but the blades could then be recycled. Now, uh, most people buy these little plastic ones that are disposable or that will last a very short period of time. Shaving foam uh, used to come in a, a block, you know, and um, that would, I still, I still use this, it lasts six months. Uh, you know, the, the stuff in the cans will last maybe two weeks. So you, you find yourself going back and throwing these things away. Um, they're not actually that cheap, but they're being engineered to encourage um, repeat purchase um, and they're doing this because they they are allowed to externalize wastes they're allowed to uh, and to externalize res the, the real cost of resources so you know my my concern is that economically um, we will need a lot of changes to implement a genuinely circular economy um, especially in these kinds of domains um, you know, th we can't really afford to allow um, uh, manufacturers to uh, to do this sort of thing. In you know, 
without any end because they will find more things to, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, tea bags, um, you know, tea bags are relatively new. They might save you a minute, but the taste of the tea is not as good, but they managed to turn a $10 commodity into a $100 commodity for the, for the manufacturer. It's the same with coffee pods. You know, you buy loose coffee like I do and you put it on the little stove top and you make your coffee and it tastes good. You get uh, coffee pods, it might taste slightly better. I don't know, you know, but the, uh, and it might save you a minute, but in the end, it's turned what you could buy for $10 into something that you pay $150 for. So there's sort of a, it's not a simple, um, it's not, it's not as though if you make these changes, you're automatically denying poor people, uh, you know, the right to consume. Uh, in fact, you may be saving them because you might be making it harder for people to go and prey on them with, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken or very cheap things, you know, that aren't necessarily very good for them. Does that make sense? I don't know whether I'm making much sense of this. It's quite a complicated topic and I'm and uh, it's quite late here as you know so <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, it makes sense to me and um, uh, uh, you're also uh, touching on something which is being sustainable could also you know um, be more um, affordable and I think that kind of relates to um, putting a price on pollution and uh, we have Dominic Hogg who will be joining us after this um, he's already here with us so um, I think we'll talk about that uh, but um, I understand what you're saying, and um, so for for uh, listeners, um, just wanted to remind you that uh, uh, questions you can um, submit them with uh, using the Q and A um, box below, and um, you're watching the Beyond the Circular Economy theme. Uh, for, for those who who just joined, you're watching Robert Crocker. Um, and we have Dominic Hogg um, starting in about uh, seven minutes. And um, so, uh, Robert. So, since we have just uh, we left with just seven minutes, could you um, so could could you maybe summarize or conclude, you know, um, uh, this panel, and then talk about what should decision makers, what should business leaders? Um, since you said um, you got good reception from business leaders for your book, and that. Um, and congratulations on the ISWA Publication Award. Um, I think that's great. So, um, yeah. so, 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 because of this, so can you um, summarize and then give some suggestions to um, or guide decision makers on what they should do? You know, think, how they should. Think, do um, yeah, I think uh, what I haven't talked about much is design and the role of design. Um, I think the role of design is critical, but my view is that as I was trying to. Uh, explain is that the problem is very complex and involves many different uh, players you know and um, that's why in the end of my book the chapter you haven't read actually is is basically all about collaboration and the importance of collaboration and I talk about what I call post cautionary products um, I use the toothbrush as an example um, it's fantastic object. Uh, actually, Napoleon had one, you know, and, and it's still there in a museum. Um, but the plastic toothbrush, 1938, uh, you know, was a, a great success in business terms. But when something is very, very successful, it becomes a legacy. And the legacy can, uh, in a sense, have uh, a lot of environmental problems. You know, we produce four billion of them. Um, you know, and this will probably rise to seven or eight in the next 10 years. Uh, most of them aren't uh, recycled. They don't recycle easily anyway. Um, how are we going to make a better one? Now, if you just talk to, this is what I say in the last chapter, if you just are going to talk to chemists, um, plastic people, uh, you know, and the corporations, they will tend to make one that's slightly more recyclable. And they'll say, oh, we fixed it. Um, but they haven't because it's still getting into the water, it's still getting into the soil, um, and it's got a life, you know, that goes on forever. So, or, you know, another hundred years or something. So we need to, um, you know, and that's why in a way uh, I emphasize the importance of design-led collaboration, design co-creation, 
because a lot of these are wicked problems. They're not, um, you know, you can't solve them on your own. You can't, you know, get some Steve Jobs to come in and go, oh, it's all going to change, you know. It doesn't, you know. It's not, it's not about individual genius, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas a designer is trying, yeah, so... Sorry. <laughs> um, no, um, that, that sounds good. We have one question which says, so should we, um, uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Mr. Welusami, and then um, he asks whether we should focus on recyclable products, since you mentioned recyclable products. Well, I think recycling is, is a, um, can be very important in certain areas, but recycling is, again, um, complicated. Some things... Uh, are very easy to recycle, like glass, even though very expensive to recycle, and and yet they don't really hurt the environment very much. Paper is, you know, relatively easy, but there are some things we don't recycle, which we it would be nice if we could, like textiles. Um, you know, we recycle far too few, and they're full of uh, chemicals that have, you know, environmental problems associated with them. Uh, plastics are another nightmare. So, so in a sense, recyclability or reusability is is very important. But even better is to make things that last longer and can be used longer um, in use. You know, and uh, even if they are a bit more expensive and they last longer, but finding the economic um, way of making these things popular, that is another problem. I'll have to write another book on that. <laughs> it's, not, it's not an easy thing to discuss in a few minutes, yeah? But no. recycling is important, but perhaps not as important. It's not the solution a lot of people imagine it to be, yeah? Take my coffee cup, you know, it's a, the, you know, the throwaway coffee cup. In theory, you can recycle it. But in Australia, um, it's not recycled, it's just buried, yeah? Right, um, which right. is a problem. <laughs> um, I hope in your next book you um, uh, not just write it for students, but also all of us. And uh, so, um, so w w with that, I think, uh, Robert, uh, thanks so much. Do you have any final concluding remarks? We have just one minute. Well, I just wanted to thank you very much for um, putting up with me for 45 minutes. I, I feel um, uh, very pleased to uh, be able to talk to you because it's nice to actually try and explain what my book is about. I think uh, some people, uh, I think on a whole, it's had quite a good reception. Um, I think some people expected me to come up with solutions, more solutions, but really the whole uh, purpose of the book was to say, well, the problem is very big and very complicated and has very deep roots, roots, historical roots, behavioral roots, technological roots. And that's, and in a sense, my, my understanding of solutions is they, they follow problems. So when you understand a problem well enough, the solution will appear. So that's why I think understanding the problem is, you know, in a sense, uh, very, very valuable. So that's that's why I've sort of structured that book in the way that I have, you know, so. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you anyway, Ranjit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, great. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. I mean, um, and um, we're really glad to, uh, to, ha uh, to have you um, to be able to discuss this um, topic over such a long time. And uh, that's the reason we changed the format so that, you know, we have enough time with each speaker for 45 minutes. And these days, I mean, um, all the uh, discussion and all, uh, all the media consumption is, you know, bite-sized and, you know, it just kind of makes the uh, dialogue more extreme. So, you know, this format was just to make sure that, you know, we have an we have an opportunity to talk and, you know, exchange ideas with, you know, bright minds. So thank you very much for joining us and... Uh, thank you. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I will. Right. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye for now. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Robert. Bye. Bye. Bye.